Wine lover Monty Walden has moved to a beautiful area of rural southwest France to make a light, fruity, drinkable wine. Well, I mean, it's always been my dream to put my own food and my own wine on the table. Monty plans to produce 6,000 bottles of red, but with a big difference. His grapes are grown with the help of the moon and planets. Using biodynamics, I make a better quality wine, and people will really notice the difference. Last time, his novice assistant, Lindsay, was left completely in charge. To Monty's surprise, there were great results. I'm impressed. You just made your first step as a biodynamic farmer. How do you feel? This week, Monty tries to save all his grapes from hungry predators. Well, that's every wine grower's worst nightmare. You know, wild boar coming in now would be an absolute disaster. <laughs> and the locals help Monty with a madcap experiment. Don't drink it. Oh, my good God. Oh! It's summer in the Pyrenees. Charming. The mountain villages are now heaving with tourists. Amongst the throng are Monty and the love of his life, Italian girlfriend Silvana, who is soaking up the rural charm and fine Catalan cuisine. What about all this chocolate thing? You know, it's just nice to come, you know, chill out, <laughs> see Silvana, spend some time with her. It's quite difficult when you're having a long-distance relationship. It's very difficult, in fact. But Monty's got to keep his eye on the other love of his life, the winemaking project. In the vineyard, the fruits of all Monty's hard labour are beginning to show. The grapes are plentiful, but they need a lot more Mediterranean sun before the man they call Monty can say yes. Really, really acid. There's no, there's no sugar in there. There's no real flavour either. It's just green, kind of stomach achy kind of flavours. Um, by sort of uh, early autumn, these grapes will be ready to pick. They'll be all of them will be nice dark red in colour, really soft and squidgy, full of sugar, full of flavour, and ready for winemaking. As well as being here on holiday, Silvana is keeping a beady eye on the project's finances, which are looking a tad shaky. Though there's some news which could put his budget on firmer ground. So looking at the yield now, how many bottles do you think you're going to get out of, uh, out of it? But at the moment, in terms of um, yield, I'm looking like making about, I would say, 20% more bottles than I planned. So that's a real bonus. And, because I have overspent, I might be able to get some of the money back. Harry, come on. That'll work out to about a thousand bottles more. It looks like Monty and Lindsay's hard work has paid off, as long as the warm weather holds. Down at the allotments, Monty's biodynamic veg are also coming on great guns. His dream to be self-sufficient moves closer with the help of 80-year-old neighbour, René. He's, he's so keen, René. <laughs> Today, they're leek planting. Basically, what René, he gave, he gave me some very good advice, actually, this morning. Because I told him about wanting to plant the leeks. So I've got two places I can plant. I'm not sure which is best. He said, well, quite simply, you just plant half in one spot, half in the other spot, and then you guarantee that it's going to work. Which I think is very, it's kind of old peasant wisdom, I think it's... Oh, messy. Right. Lindsay has finally made friends with the chickens who are now laying more than enough. <laughs> Words got round that our man Monty has the healthiest looking plot in the village. He now has a regular stream of visitors marvelling at his vegetables. Viens pour les pommes de terre. That's it, yeah, that's peppers. Oui, poivron, oui, oui. Up till now, the locals have scoffed at Monty's methods of growing everything using cosmic forces. So, but he's saying that I'm, I'm the only one here who doesn't have a, the insect that eats the potatoes. He said, but you did put an insecticide on us. I said, no. So it seems there could be something to this biodynamics after all. Right. 
With everything growing so well, it's time for Monty to start thinking about what to do with his grapes once they're ripe. Monty has set his heart on making his wine in a traditional concrete vat. They're expensive and hard to come by, but the local cooperative has 24 of them. Unfortunately, Monty is out of luck. They're all booked. There's a real shortage of places to make wine in this part of France, and particularly in this particular part of this area of France. So he heads off to see his wine-making neighbour for advice. Eric, Eric! Eric's family make their wine in new plastic tanks, then age it in expensive oak barrels. None of this suits Monty's light, fruity-styled wine, which doesn't need this maturing process. But down in Eric's cellar, there's a welcome surprise. Concrete vats. This, is, this was a wine vat in here, OK? Obviously, this wall's been taken away for storage space. You've got four vats here, and obviously there are dividing walls here. And each tank obviously has a trap door, because you need to empty the tank, because we're going to put the grapes in here. The, to make red wine, you need to put the grapes and the pips. Everything goes in there. And to get that out, you need a big hole. Monty's hoping to do a deal. Well, what, basically what he said, OK, if you want to use them, you can, but you've got to put the work in and, and, and fix them. So when he was 10 years old, 1975, that's the last time he saw these tanks um, full of wine. So. I mean, it's not the easiest solution, but the prize is making red wine in cement tanks, which is what I love. I hate stainless steel. And what is great about cement is they're very good at insulating, so what you really want is your tank to warm up as the fermentation starts, and then to stay warm if it gets cold outside. But no one's seen inside these vats for over 30 years. Yeah, we, we, nobody, we don't, none of us really know what to expect here, because, Christ, look at the grime on that, Jesus. A lot of spiders, oh my God, <laughs> look at that, Jesus. Whoa, it's pretty dirty. It's pretty tall as well. That is a hell of a job. Monty might be getting these vats for free, but it'll take a large amount of spit and polish to make them perfect for his wine. It will be a challenge to do this, but I think it'd be quite an interesting project. Thanks, sir. Why? All right. Today, it's the 13th of July, and Monty is 40 years old. To celebrate, he's organising a birthday barbecue, and he's invited the whole village. The athletic mayor is the guest of honour. Lindsay's on a mission to improve her franglais for tonight's party. If I was to say to the mayor, for example, yes. um, when can I... Uh, when can we meet yes. to go running? What would I say to him? You probably want to say to him, you're going jogging, which in French is called footing. Oh, OK. Which is quite a nice little thing. Wait, so, quand est-ce qu'on peut se rencontrer pour faire le footing? That's quite a mouthful to say, isn't it? Yeah. I think I'm at a disadvantage because of my accent as well, being very broad uh, Birmingham. When you leave, everyone round here is going to speak English with the Brahmi <laughs> accent. That's right. <laughs> but I think I ought to teach the lesson. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, well, au revoir. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Down at the village square, Monty has organised a feast for the 40-plus guests, including snails, locally caught sardines, and a whole lamb that will be stuffed with rosemary and garlic. So oh, that's exactly what I wanted. I mean, I wanted yeah. something that's freshly killed, really um, looks like really top quality lamb. Very, very pleased about that. Monty's on a charm offensive. His integration would be greatly helped if he could convince the villagers he's just a regular Englishman. Salut, Claudie. Salut. In a small village, rumours start very quickly, and people do tend to get the wrong end of the stick. And some people clearly think I'm completely bonkers. But in terms of um, people's understanding of uh, the wine project here, the, um, there's been some good uh, chats and good explanations, and I've had to do quite a bit of explaining tonight. Bonjour, ça va? Bonjour. Ça va? 
Uh, uh, ça va? Et toi? Moi, oui. <laughs> Conversational French with a sheep farmer is one thing, but inviting the mayor for a run is a bigger challenge. Est-ce qu'on va faire... Qu'on va faire le jogging? Yes! <laughs> I've got it. Yeah, you got it. By Jave, I she's think she's got it. Bonsoir. 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 Quand est-ce qu'on va faire le jogging? Oui, oui, d'accord. OK, à quelle heure? Uh, demain. Demain. 10 heures, 10h15, 10 heures. Oh, 10, is that 10? Oh, oui! Oui. Oui. OK. Yeah, OK. Demain, 10 o'clock. Demain, à l'auberge, en bas. The charm offensive seems to be paying off, especially on the gastronomique front. Snells have got a thumbs up from Serge, so anything he eats, I know that I can. <laughs> Not such large quantities, but... Ah, what could be better? A warm summer's evening in a French village square. It seems the mad dog and Englishman have at last been accepted into the local community. But as our man Monty is about to discover, it doesn't last long. The warm summer sunshine in the Pyrenees is steadily ripening Monty's Carignan grapes. It won't be long till the harvest and Monty's found a perfect place to make his wine. Last night, his birthday party for the villagers of Saint-Martin-de-Fenouet was a huge success. His chipper mood is somewhat dampened by a hangover. Yeah, last night was a bit of a big night last night. Uh, but yeah, when, when all the villagers who came seemed to be really, um, they said it was really, really good, so. Thank you very much. At precisely 10 o'clock, Lindsay is ready and waiting for an assignation. Her French lessons have clearly paid off. <laughs> the mayor is a champion marathon runner and is currently training for a grueling race across the Sahara Desert. The five-mile circuit he'll take Lindsay on will be no more than a warm-up for him. Yeah. With the party now over, Silvana has to get back to her high-powered job in Italy. But she'll be back to help Monty come harvest time. It's now late August, and the harvest is not far away. In the winery, it's time to get dirty. Today, Monty and Lindsay begin the job of renovating the old traditional concrete vats. They've been neglected for nearly 40 years. Monty's grapes will live in here for nearly a month, fermenting slowly into alcoholic wine. This is quite tight squeeze, isn't it? Lindsay, can you stop looking up my shorts, please? I can't actually say anything. If he gets it right, Monty's Plonk will be a light, fruity wine to dine for. But that's a little way off. To whet Lindsay's appetite, Monty's organized a little wine tasting to get an idea of what their wine might be like. Uh, well, the idea is to see what the competition are doing. I'm working with a, well, we're working with a Carignan grape with a bit of Syrah and a bit of Grenache blended in the vineyard. So it makes sense to check out what the competition is doing. So the wines I've asked Jean to select are all Carignan based. When you're swirling it around and spitting it out, what are you... What are you trying right. First of all, I'm looking, you know, were the grapes ripe when they were picked? Okay. And if not, the wine will taste bitter and green and horrible. And your mouth will be like that, OK? Are there any obvious faults? Um, maybe the cork wasn't very good quality, so the wine has a corky taste, for example. And then it's up to your personal choice. What I want you to do, when you taste this wine, 
Think about the sensation it makes on your tongue, OK? It's like a tingly sensation. Oh, hallelujah. OK, so that has a fault. Oh, wow. It's red wine. Well, it's red wine. It's not supposed to be fizzy, is it? So it's either re-fermenting in bottle. There's some kind of fault there. It's the most expensive wine we've tried today. Mm. If I was in a restaurant, send it back. Oh, now I like the smell of that. So that's got a kind of what we'd say like a sexy mm. smell, hasn't it? Not really thick and... Oh, uh, it's, uh, Jean, that's corked. There's a chemical in the cork that has reacted with the wine and made it taste like hamster cages. Oh. Uh, well, I think all wine tastings generally, you know, it's not, I think the truism is it's not always the most expensive wine that's the best. It's not always the cheapest that's the best value either. The top three, you've got one at six, one at seven, and one at 12. And I personally, I think this is really good value for money. I'd be really happy to make a wine like this. Less than eight euros a bottle, OK? The one kind of thing that is against us is these guys have been doing it for years and years and years. But I think um, we can give them a run for their money. That's brave talk from a novice. He's still got a lot to learn. Up in the vineyard, he's hit a problem. Someone or something has been tampering with his prized bunches of ripe grapes. He goes to Eric, his neighbor, for some answers. That night, Monty catches the culprit, red-handed. Well, that's every wine grower's worst nightmare. They killed uh, 2,000 boar in this area last year, and it's still, it's still a big problem. Uh, I said, what can I do about it? He said, electric fence? He said, it's the biggest problem we have. So he said, listen, if you don't, if you don't sort your boar problem out, you won't get any grapes. This could be a real disaster. Monty's grapes are nearly ready for picking, and he was banking on getting an extra 1,000 bottles to help his profits. Unless he takes immediate action, he'll have no grapes to harvest. It's such a big problem. Other local winemakers meet three times a week to deal with the boar invasion. Domesticated pigs have escaped and have bred with the boar. Yeah. And they now, their litters are much bigger than they were before. So there's a lot of massive overpopulation of boar. So there have been two shots. Yep, let's go up. So they've already gutted it. That was pretty quick work. Let's have a look. The boar will be butchered, and Monty will get a share. They all, all of them at various points today have said that hunting is it's a virus. They've got it in their blood. And the reason they've got it in their blood is this is one of the poorest regions of France. And this is a valuable source of uh, protein for humans as well. So hunting boar isn't just, it's not for fun, it is really for food. None of the boar gets wasted. At the end of the day, Monty has a small favour to beg of the hardy hunters. But it could undo all his efforts to be accepted as a normal member of their community. <laughs> <laughs> he said these English people are very, very strange. Monty's experiment is to fortify the vineyard from boar attack using human urine and a kilometre of electric fencing. A quick shock and the pungent smell rather than a bullet, Monty thinks, is a kinder way to get rid of the boar. You don't mind that. Do you? I can't believe we're doing this. To well, it's all part of the game, Len, I mean. Um, oh, look at the colour of it! It's disgusting. What's wrong with that? <laughs> See, Pete. Well, that it should be clear. Well, you know. I suppose all right. That smell, that stress. Don't drink it. Oh my good God! There's no way you're getting me to do that, and no chance. It's not bad. Oh. Fear not. Monty's not that mad. Just a wee joke at Lindsay's expense. It's only chamomile tea, but the rest is 100% genuine French-made urine. How charming. Oh, look at the colour of that. That's a good one, that one. Will you get right in there, Obi? Oh, it's warm. And so if we then just stick it onto that post there, like, there we go. That's it. See, why aren't you doing this? 
Because you were the one that said you wanted to change your life and have new experiences. I mean, this is <laughs> yeah. all part of life's rich tapestry, isn't it? I mean... I think this is completely nuts, what he's just done today. Just bonkers. But, you know, I have to do as he says, so... Monty has no idea if his experiment will work. But he and Lindsay are going to find out tonight when they camp over in the newly renovated shack to keep guard on their precious crop. Very cosy. I'm looking forward to tonight. I think it'd be quite... It's different, isn't it? I don't like camping, actually, normally, but it's important that, you know, we protect what we've done so far. And for supper, there's freshly killed wild boar steaks. It's all dark and it's a bit scary. <laughs> I think we've spent so long uh, looking after these grapes. You know, wild boar coming in now would be an absolute disaster. Which is why Harry has been promoted to head of security. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep him in the van with the windows open. If he smells the boar, he'll bark, uh, and that means that he won't be jumping on my bed all night with his mucky little paws. We've got no pillows or anything, you know. No, well, we, this is the, um... You all right, Harold? Um, no, no noise is good news. Well, good night, then. Very good night, Angie. <laughs> An hour after bedding down, Harry raises the alarm. They quickly discover the defences have been breached. You can see there are more tracks here. You see how the earth has all been disturbed? Well, that's... you can see they've been in here, look. No rain. How on earth The little blighters have tunnelled in under the electric wire. Big hole, big hole, big hole, big hole. You just hoover off the grapes, you know, they just suck them off. The little as they wait just until you're about to pick them, because they're nice and sweet, and the little come in overnight and they eat them all. His experiment is a miserable failure. The wild boar have outwitted our man, Monty. OK, OK. The big question is, how much of his crop is left? Next time, a highly regarded wine expert arrives in town to try Monty's red. Kind of a colour. And he gives Monty's biodynamic ideas a rough ride. <laughs> Complete uh, hogwash. Pie in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Go to channel4.com slash four homes for an exclusive interview with Monty and find out how you could invest abroad. Next, how a controversial purity movement is sweeping the states. Cutting Edge meets the Virgin Daughters.